reports from that guy's mother that I had left some two hours before. So my mom is just stringing me along, right? And finally she, she pulls and sets the hook, right? Did you take your girlfriend home? So again, I have the opportunity to tell the truth, take whatever consequences come with it. But apparently I didn't have the ability. My brain short-circuited. No. Well, that's funny because I just called this boy's mother and she said that y'all left a good hour and a half ago, which would put you home 45 minutes late for curfew. And in that moment, I'm caught, right? And, and if, you, if you can think back to those moments, hopefully it's been a long time since you've been doing things you weren't supposed to do and got caught. You remember the panic that sets in. Right? Yes? Your body goes into full-blown panic. There's alarms going off. You hear bells and whistles you've never heard before in your brain. Your eyes start twitching. They get really big. And you panic. Sometimes people will begin to cry. Girls, typically. No offense. Ladies, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I would imagine that there are ladies in here that have gotten out of speeding tickets because they cry. That never works. I cry every time they pull me over, and it never ever works. Some people cry. Some people begin to shout and scream and, and throw a, try to direct the, the attention away. Maybe they try to change the subject. Your body goes into some of these weird things like it starts to sweat profusely. It is not a good feeling at all. Now, common sense would say, well, then just don't do the thing that you got caught doing, right? Right? That would make sense, wouldn't it? you don't want to go through that, then don't do whatever it was that you got caught doing. Do you know what the world will tell you? Do better next time at not getting caught. Do whatever you want, just don't get caught. In John chapter 4, you have a woman who listened to the world. She had been doing basically whatever she wanted. And when she gets caught, for lack of a better term, she is faced with some pretty, pretty harsh questions. Some pretty significant decisions. I've entitled this lesson, Life After Failure. <laughs> and I've got a couple of these that we're going to go through the next few times that I'm up here. But I love this one in particular because this one, this Life After Failure, reveals true worship. Which is amazing. Jesus is by all means the master teacher. <clears throat> and he's going to take a situation that seems really, really dark and bleak. And he's going to turn it into a rejoicing, overjoyed, worshiping group of people that up until this point really hadn't bought in. In John chapter 4, let's begin... Let's go to verse 7 to begin. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Verse 10, Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Stop right there just for a moment before we transition into the next part of her conversation. It's an innocent conversation, really. I mean, truthfully, what Jesus asks of her is not insulting. It was typical of the day. 
It was typical of the day for men to ask women there to draw water. It was typical of that day for, for them to do so without really any question. Her question comes out of a realization that Jesus is a Jew and she's a Samaritan. And she says, how are you asking me to do this? Because your kind of people don't talk to my kind of people. Your kind of people have no dealings with my kind of people. As a matter of fact, the first six verses of John chapter 4 tell you that Jesus chose to go through Samaria, which was totally opposite of what most Jews would do. Most Jews would go out of their way, many miles out of their way, as a matter of fact, to avoid going through Samaria. So her first thing that she notices is Jesus is someone totally different than what she's used to in the manner that he actually talks to her. Now we could get into the chauvinistic society of the day and the fact that a man speaking to a woman in conversation was a little bit odd anyway. There's that aspect of it as well. So not only is it a Jew talking to a Samaritan, it's a man talking to a woman conversationally in public, which was not really the norm that in that day. Jesus is definitely different, first of all, than what she's accustomed to. But the second thing that I want you to notice is what she says at the end of that little section. She wants this water that he's offering, this everlasting water, really for selfish reasons. Number one, she doesn't want to be thirsty again. That's fine. That would be basically everyone. But it's the second reason that should draw your attention. The second reason why she wants this everlasting water is so that she won't have to come here and draw water again. If you notice the time frame, this is the middle of the day. Going to get water in the middle of the day was typically, I won't say you never did it, but typically it was unheard of. The women would get up early in the morning while it was still relatively cool, and they would go and draw water in the early in the morning so that it wasn't such a hassle to do so. And that would be sort of the equivalent, no pun intended, of the water cooler today at your office. The women would gather around the well and they would sort of shoot the gossip back and forth of their particular community, their particular town. It was a, it was a camaraderie. The women of the town sort of got together every morning. They all drew their water. They all talked. They all met together. And then they went back to their homes. This is a woman coming in the middle of the day. Like I said, typically, that's not how you operated. It was hot. There's no one there for you to meet and talk to because no one was drawing water in the middle of the day. It was too much of a hassle to do so. It was too much of a hassle and too much work to, to haul that jug home. So there's something about her that is revealed in that statement. Give me this water so I will never be thirsty again, and I won't have to come to this well to draw water. Now, you and I know what it is because if you read ahead, you know exactly what it is. If you've heard this story before, you know exactly what it is. Jesus knows exactly what it is. He knows, sadly, that her life is one big failure. He knows that there's not a day that goes by that she doesn't wake up and feel like a total abject failure. He knows that every day of her life she deals with the whispers, the pointing, the gesturing, the head shaking, the disappointment, the anger of not just the women in her little town, but the men too. Jesus is well aware of this woman's issue. Which as a side point, let me just say this to make it practical for us. What makes you think he doesn't know what you're going through? What makes you think, what makes me think that Jesus doesn't know exactly my feelings when I wake up every morning? My struggles that I go through every day. But in this case, as you move on, you know what's about to happen. Jesus said to her, this is picking up with where we left off. Verse 16, Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you're right in saying I have no husband, for you have had 
five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. Okay, you know what he's getting at. You've had five. The one you're with is not yours, which means it's someone else's. The picture becomes really clear about why she's drawing the water in the middle of the afternoon, in the middle of the day. When you realize that she's been married five separate times, and she is now participating in an adulterous relationship with somebody else's husband. It makes sense, doesn't it? She wakes up every morning feeling like everyone hates me. There are men in this community that wish I were dead and gone. There are women in this community that wish I were dead and gone. There's, there's people all throughout this community that wish that I didn't exist. There are people in this community that wish I had never shown my face here. That's every morning. Some of us have bad days. I get that. This woman didn't have a good day. Verse 19, the woman said, Sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Remember what I said about when you get caught, some of the things that naturally happen? One of the things that I told you is you try to change the subject. This has nothing to do with what Jesus just told her, is it? I mean, it, this has nothing to do with her relationships. She tries to change the subject. I perceive you're a prophet. We talked about worship, and, and our, you know, our fathers said we worship in these mountains, and you say worship in Jerusalem. And Jesus says what? Woman, believe me. The hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem we worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here. If you underline you mark in your Bible, mark that. The hour is coming and is now here. When the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming. He who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. In this section, we find a couple of things. Number one, you find this challenge to reject strongholds. You'll see that on your handout. Verses 19 and 20. Her response to Jesus calling out her sin is to change the subject. But in changing the subject, she actually reveals another issue that she's dealing with. And that is, the, in her eyes, the inconsistency that she's hearing from quote-unquote religion. Our father said to worship here. You guys say worship in Jerusalem, so apparently there's some inconsistency there. And Jesus is quick to correct her, even before he's going to get back to her needing to change her ways and repent and those kinds of things. He's going to correct her. I'm telling you that the time is coming and is now here. We're not going to worship on the mountains. We're not going to worship in Jerusalem. It's going to be those who worship the Father in spirit and in truth. And the Father is seeking those who will worship him that way. That's a huge revelation, whether you and I admit it or not, or whether we even acknowledge it or notice it, or maybe you've ever thought about it before. That is a huge revelation by Jesus. For generations, it had been all about the place that you went. For generations, it had been all about the style of the building or the particular place geographically that you went. And Jesus says, stop all that. The time is coming and is now here. We're going to worship the Father. You're going to worship Him in spirit and in truth. And the Father is actively seeking those that do so. He says, God is not a man to be worshipped. God is not some idol, some statue, some building to be worshipped. God is spirit. And them that worship Him will worship Him in spirit and in truth. It's a major revelation. And what he's teaching her to do is reject strongholds. Now let me clarify what I mean by that. 
unfortunately, many of us, myself included, the way that we've been raised, I'm not knocking parenting at all, but the way that we've been raised has totally defined what we believe. Rather than our own personal Bible study, rather than our own personal searching the Scriptures to find out what is true, we have simply relied on what our parents told us. We've relied on what our grandparents did, what our great-grandparents did, what our great-great-great-grandparents did, and so on and so forth. We've relied on things like popularity. Well, my friends all go to this particular church, so it must be right. We've relied on entertainment to determine our choices when it comes to religion, and I use that term kind of loosely. And rather than searching the scriptures to find out that if we are worshiping in spirit and in truth, we don't really search the scriptures at all. We just basically make decisions based on our emotions. And truthfully, we don't really commit to it then. We just kind of go, well, you know what, today I'm happy, so I guess that's good. Next Sunday, if they do something or say something I don't like, then I'll just go somewhere else. And the week after that, if I don't like what they said the week before, I'll just go somewhere else. And really, does it even matter? I mean, I can just go somewhere. And as long as the guy up there is talking, and sometimes in some places, as long as the girl up there is talking about God, I mean, isn't that a good thing? Hmm. In both cases, whether it is I'm holding on to tradition for tradition's sake, Matthew chapter 15, verses 1 through 9, Jesus dismantles that whole argument. Do you remember what he does there? The Pharisees kind of jump on his disciples for not doing things the way that they've always done it. Oof, there's a phrase that just sends chills. They kind of jump on the disciples for not doing things the way they've always done it. And Jesus says, let me correct you. Let me stop you really quickly. Since when has it become okay for you to teach commandments of men as doctrine? Well, the answer to that is it's never okay to do that. <laughs> it's never okay to do that. Sadly, we, we've done the same thing sometimes. We've taken our traditions and we put them on a pedestal. We've said, yeah, that's equal to the word of God. And wow, how arrogant and wrong. Just to put it bluntly. You have a woman here who is basing her religious experience off of traditions, off of strongholds in her personal life. And Jesus chops that down to the ground. So forget that. Stop. Stop placing your previous religious experience above what I'm telling you. That's the second point that you find in this particular part of the conversation, verse 26. She says, I know the Messiah is coming. He who is called the Christ, and he will explain to us all things. And Jesus says, I who speak to you am he. Sadly, she didn't even recognize the Savior, and he was sitting right in front of her. To be totally transparent, we do the same thing every time we come together. The Savior is right in front of us and we just don't even recognize Him. Johnny stood up here a few minutes ago and talked to us about what, what, it, what it is that we think about as we go through the Lord's Supper. Well, I will confess to you today, there have been many Sundays that I've just simply taken the emblems and moved on with my day. And I didn't recognize the Savior on the cross right in front of me. Now what that does for this woman is change her life completely. Drastically. Instantly. Her life goes from lost to saved in a matter of minutes. In a matter of minutes. If you back up to verses 16 through 18, you'll notice Jesus calls her sin what it is. Go call your husband. You, I don't have one. Now, you said correctly that you don't have one. You've had five, and the one you're with is not your own. What you've said is true. That's the phrase you need to pay attention to. Jesus is calling her out for her bad decisions. Now, he's doing it in love, which is what we should all do. I understand that. I'm not trying to say he's not. 
But he is calling out her actions. What you've said is true. You don't have a husband. you got somebody else's. It's wrong. Now the question must be, are you ready to repent? That's why I put a question mark there in your handout. Because a lot of people will acknowledge their sin, but they're not ready to repent. Yeah, I know. I, I can't tell you how many times I've had this conversation with, in varying degrees. I know I ought to quit doing fill in the blank. But, and then we give some sort of human excuse. It's really hard to. I understand that. I know that I ought to do this, but I just don't feel like I can do it. I can't tell you how many times I've had that conversation in varying degrees. And some of you have had that very conversation with people that you love and you care about. And you know, you know that they're not in a right relationship with God. And they continue to look at you and they continue to say, I, I know, but, I know, but, on these last three Thursday nights, we've been talking about baptism and we've tried to be very, open about it and scripture based about it because that's the only way we can do this and do it appropriately. And one of the conversations that I overheard in the groups that were talking is the, the concept of so many people knowing they need to be baptized for the forgiveness of their sins and they just won't do it. For reasons literally only known to them. Because they will tell you that they know the information. They will tell you that they know the scriptures. They will tell you that they know they need to be forgiven of their sins and that the only way that can happen fully is through the baptism that God talks about in his word. They will tell you that. And you'll say, okay, well then, here is water. What doth hinder you? And they'll say things like, oh, I just don't think I can today. So that's why I put it as a question mark. Because truthfully, for a lot of people, it comes down to answering that question. Are you ready to repent? Because we know what repentance means. By Webster's dictionary definition, we know what it means. It means to turn from something. But when it gets to the actuality of doing that, it becomes a very big struggle for people. Yes, I'm ready to become a Christian. But if you got them to answer fully, they would say, I'm ready to become a Christian, but I'm not ready to repent. I'm ready to become a Christian, but those things that I struggle with, I'm not ready to give up yet. That's what Jesus is attacking in this woman. In a loving and caring and compassionate way, he is going at this woman and saying, look, here's what your sin is. What you've said is true. And now basically the ball is in her court. What are you going to do about it? Her first response is typical humanity. Change the subject. Get out of this conversation. I don't want to talk about it. She talks about where to worship. But look at what happens. There's this little bit of, a, of an interlude here, verses 27 to 30, where the disciples come back. But in that, there's a revelation. And I want you to pay attention to it. Verse 27, just then his disciples came back. They marveled that he was talking with a woman. Notice they didn't, they didn't even really care about the whole Samaritan Jew thing. They were more concerned that Jesus was talking to a woman. Okay, But no one said, what do you seek or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar. The whole reason she came that day was to get water, right? That's the only reason she came up there. She leaves behind the only thing that was holding her to that geographic location and went away into town and said to the people, Come see a man who told me all I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of the town and were coming to him. Jesus begins to speak to his disciples, verses 31 to 38, and he basically preaches them a, a sermon very similar to hers. They ask a question about food, and he discusses with them the fact that I have a food. My food is to do the will of him who sent me to accomplish his work. Verse 38, I sent you to reap that, that for which you did not labor. Others have labored. You have entered into their labor. 
somewhere in that conversation, we're not given the word for word, but somewhere in that conversation, post verse 26, some real repentance takes place. You know how I know that? Because of her response. It's not a response that's normal. It should be, but it's not. It should be the norm. When we repent of our sins and we are buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life, we ought to be jumping at the opportunity to snatch up every person we come in contact with and tell them about it because it ought to change everything about who you are and where you're going. Verse 39 tells you all you need to know about this woman and her conversation with Jesus. The Bible tells us there in verse 39, many Samaritans from that town believed in him, John doesn't mince words, because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. Now think about that for a second. If you go back to verse 1, Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John. He left Judea, departed again for Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. He's just passing through. This is just a cut through. And he's going to wind up staying some three days with these people because of a conversation with this woman. A life full of failure now becomes a life full of salvation. A life that should be a total loss becomes a life that saves others. A life that was built on religious strongholds that were false now is a life that is living in true worship. This story is far more than just Jesus talking to a woman at a well. This story is far more than Jesus calling out a woman's adulterous relationships. This, is, this story is far more than Jesus dealing with her sin. This story is about Jesus being the Messiah. And that's the greatest thing that's ever happened. That's the greatest thing that's ever happened to you. It's the greatest thing that's ever happened to me. It's the greatest thing that's ever happened to this entire world. Is that our Heavenly Father, our Creator, looked down upon us. And while we were still sinners, the Messiah the Chosen One, died for us. You will find no greater example of love. You will find no greater example of sacrifice. Not in history, not in any story. You will find it in reality. This morning, the reality of the situation is if you're not a Christian and you find yourself in the same position as this woman was before she got to the well that morning. If you're not a Christian, you find yourself in the same exact position as this woman was in. When Jesus said, draw me some water, if you're not a Christian this morning, you find yourself in the same position as this woman when you are confronted with your sins. Are you running away from them and trying to change the subject? Now, are you ready to repent? 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 10 says, Godly sorrow produces repentance. As a parent, you've probably asked your kids this very question. Are you sorry that you did what you did or are you sorry that you got caught? Well, as an immature person mentally, my answer was always I was sorry that I got caught. I may not have said that out loud, but that's what I was thinking. Is I, I'm, I'm not sorry that I did what I did. I'm sorry that I got caught. As I have matured, I have realized the difference. One is human sorrow. I don't want to go through the human consequences of being caught, so I, don't want, I didn't want to go through this. That's the I'm sorry I got caught mentality. 
But godly sorrow is vastly different. Godly sorrow produces inside of me this desire to turn away from those things that I've done. Godly sorrow produces repentance. One final passage that I want to share with you as we close. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And I hope that you'll bear with me. We're going to read a few verses here as we close. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. This begins in verse 18. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Pay attention to this last section, please. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth, but God. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of Him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. In that section, if you notice how many times Paul wrote the words, God chose, God chose, God chose, God chose. And then he finally wraps it up with this phrase, because of him, you are in Christ Jesus. When this woman sat down at this well, she was outside of God. She was outside of Jesus. She had no hope, Ephesians chapter 2 says, without God in the world. An alien, one set apart, not for a positive reason, but sadly for a negative reason. One lost. This morning, are you like this woman? Praise be that we continue to read John chapter 4, and we find out that she heard and she believed, and she was ready to repent. She confessed who he was. She confessed who he was. She believed. Do you believe this morning? We know that after the death of Christ on the cross and his resurrection three days later, we find in the day of Pentecost the apostles preaching and Peter preaches a sermon. And in that sermon, he preaches about the very idea about godly sorrow producing repentance. It happens when he says, This Jesus whom you crucified, God has made both Lord and Christ. In that moment, godly sorrow attacks the hearts of those men. And in full repentance, they shout, what should we do? Peter says, repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. I plead with you to do the same this morning. If you're not a baptized believer, if you've never put on Christ in baptism, what is it that's holding you back? What is it? Are we making excuses now? Is this a scenario where you are continuing to change the subject instead of facing down what it is you need to do? And if so, know that there are people here waiting with open arms that want to help you. I want to study with you. I want to talk about this. I want to point you to the Scriptures and what God has to say about it.